Thanks, Jared. Thanks, teens. It was uh, so much fun to see their pictures and see all that they were doing down there in Phoenix. And we do certainly pray for our team in Phoenix, as many of them watch our services every week. I was able to be at a conference with uh, Pastor Dave from Phoenix and got to connect with him a little bit and encourage him. And that was a good time of encouragement for them, for us as well. And I'm glad, glad to be back. I was gone last Sunday, and we were in Indianapolis. Uh, Pastor Zach said I was at camp. And he didn't know what he's talking about, uh, basically. I wasn't at camp. I was in Indianapolis, and we were at a conference. And then after the conference, it's a vacation. And then we went down to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, which sounds like you needed an Ark last week. While we were looking at the Ark last week, which was uh, a fun experience. Uh, but we had a good time away. It was a good conference. Our church is part of a, an association of churches. Uh, many of you may know that. Some of you don't know that. Um, I'm fairly heavily involved in that group. It's a national association. Uh, I've written a couple books for the publishing house, for the association. I just got done writing an article for the magazine. I was on a five-person search committee to choose a new national leader for our church association. And we made that selection, and in this last meeting, we had a vote. All the messengers came from churches. We voted on a new national leader, and he happens to be one of my best friends. So you can either take that as a really good thing or a really bad thing. Uh, however you read that, uh, I think it's a really good thing, of course. And so we're excited for the future to see where God leads the association, and uh, the Lord's been doing some good things with our group of churches, even with church planting. Our church plant down in Phoenix was, is supported in part by our church association, so we're kind of getting connected that way. Uh, but we're encouraged with what God's doing. Thanks for your prayers as we were gone. I'm back for this Sunday and two after, uh, and then I'm going to be gone again to camp, actually, for real this time. I'm going to be gone to camp, and then some vacation after that in Colorado. So just good to be back for a few Sundays and be with our church family. Let's bow for a word of prayer this morning as we get ready to look into the Word today. Father, thank you today that we can worship. Thank you that we can sing. Thank you that we can look into your Word and talk about this great book of the Bible named Jonah and to hear a story about a man that in many ways as we read it, we see ourselves in his story. Father, I pray that we would have the proper view of who you are, that we'd have a proper view of your love and your mercy and your grace Father, help us to see how you work and see how you work in our lives and to appreciate that and to not fight that, uh, but to be obedient to your word, to be obedient to what you want for us and to not have our own agenda as so often we do. Lord, you are good to us and we love you. We thank you that we can worship together. We're thankful that we can look into your word and come around the word as a body of Christ and we just pray your blessing upon the ministry of the word this morning. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. My name is Jonah, son of Amittai, prophet of God to Israel. Now I'm sure that many of you would have lots of questions for me about what the inside of a fish looks like. Though I could answer those questions, I'm not going to answer those questions because that is absolutely not the most important part of my story. In fact, God's activities around this time were far more fishy than me getting swallowed by a big fish. And let me tell you about some of those. Have you ever heard of irony? Because my story is really all about irony. Before you judge me, though, my first name is Jonah. But many of you, your middle name is Jonah. You are a lot like me whether you know it or not, because we all at different times fight the will of God. And if you were in my sandals, I'm sure that you would have the same struggle. It was a very confusing time in my life and a confusing time to figure out what God was trying to do. I want to explain a little bit about those difficulties that I faced. I had had a great career as a prophet. I hailed from northern Israel in the area of Galilee. My task was to preach repentance to people who were far from God, people who needed the grace and the mercy of our God. That was my job. 
I was preaching to the northern ten tribes. You see, after the reign of Solomon, Israel split into two nations, the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes, Israel and Judah. My job was on the northern ten tribes, and it was a difficult job because the northern ten tribes never followed God after the reign of Solomon. In fact, after Solomon's reign and after the kingdom split, we never had a godly king after that, and it was a downward spiral. And many of us who were prophets had the unfortunate job of preaching gloom and doom to our people, to our nation, to proclaim the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel. I had other friends and other prophets. One of my friends, his name was Hosea. And Hosea had even a more difficult job than I did because God told Hosea to marry a prostitute. His entire life was an object lesson. And I always thought to myself, I'm so glad I'm not Hosea. I'm so glad that my job isn't as difficult as Hosea's. And then this happened. And suddenly my job did get very difficult. Hosea's message was judgment and punishment. And the most disturbing thing about Hosea's message, however, was the fact that it wasn't going to be just any nation that was going to punish Israel. If Israel didn't change her ways and repent, God was going to use a nation to punish her. And it wasn't just any nation. It was a particularly evil and disgusting nation named Assyria. Assyria was a difficult nation to deal with. All of the nations in the Near East walked on eggshells as it related to Assyria. They were second to no one for corruption, debauchery, and cruelty. The Assyrians didn't simply conquer nations. They humiliated and tortured and slaughtered nations simply for fun, simply to strike fear in the hearts of those that they were conquering. Now, you all here in the 21st century live fairly comfortable lives, but let me try to help you understand what it was like living with Assyria close by and the threat of Assyria coming to conquer your land. Let's just say for a moment that somehow ISIS had made serious inroads into the United States. Let's say for a moment that ISIS had made it all the way up to Missouri. In fact, they were on the border between Iowa and Missouri, and they were advancing northward. And as they came northward and conquered the different towns, they would take city leaders and other key people and burn them alive in cages. How would you feel about now? What kind of discomfort would you have? Thinking that at any moment these savages could be knocking on your door to kill your wife, to kill your kids, to take you captive. That's what we all lived with as it related to Assyria. They were a cruel, brutal, disgusting nation. Hosea, my friend and prophet, talked about Assyria and what they would do to the people of Israel. He said it like this in Hosea chapter 13, verse 16, Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their little ones shall be dashed in pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. Assyria was a disgusting nation, and this was the threat that we were facing. If this nation did not repent, God would use Assyria to judge his people. At one point in my ministry, God came to me and gave me a message. We had a new king. His name was King Jeroboam. And like all the other kings before him, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. The nation was struggling and was plagued by invading neighbors and marauders, but surprisingly, God gave me a message of hope and encouragement. God came to me one day and told me to go to King Jeroboam and tell Jeroboam that he was going to give Jeroboam victory in his military campaigns and that we would be able to reclaim back some territory and push the surrounding nations back and gain our independence from some of these surrounding nations. This was great news. 
And for a moment, I thought maybe things were turning the right way. I thought maybe that Israel was repenting and maybe God was going to relent the incoming judgment, that maybe Assyria would not come and judge Israel. In fact, at the same time all of these things were happening, Assyria was starting to crack and their hold was beginning to loosen on the earth because their sin and their debauchery and their cruelty was starting to catch up with them and their backs were starting to break underneath the weight of the sin and it wouldn't be long it seemed that Assyria would someday be conquered and to tell you the truth I couldn't wait to see that happen to tell you the truth I wanted Assyria to continue down the path of sin I was hoping that soon Assyria would be conquered that God would judge that evil nation that they would get what was coming to them that they would burn in hell for their sins this was my hope I didn't want anything more than to see Assyria go down in flames. Then God stepped in and began speaking to me. And I was optimistic to hear what he had to say. Maybe I would be the one that could go and preach doom and gloom to the Assyrians instead of my own people. Maybe this was the time that things would turn. Maybe God was going to restore Israel and I would get to go and tell Assyria that she was due for judgment. You can imagine my horror when instead God called me to walk into the mouth of the lion and to call the Assyrians, the enemy, to call the Assyrians to repentance. The disgust I felt in my stomach to think that our God would offer forgiveness and grace to these vile, undeserving creatures that Yahweh would see fit to save sinners like this disgusted me. How could God save such wretched people? This was too far. God had gone too far. This was over the top. This was wrong on so many levels. Israel was God's people. Why wasn't God going to give mercy to Israel and said he's going to give mercy to the Assyrians? Nobody cared about God in Assyria. At least in Israel, there were some people still trying to worship God, but not in Assyria. Why would God offer mercy and grace to Assyria? They were totally undeserving people. The worst part about this is if they repented and if they were to turn to God, it might actually preserve them from judgment for just a little longer. In fact, the thing that really irritated me in my soul was that if I went and preached repentance to the Assyrians, it may hold off the judgment of God just long enough for them to come and destroy Israel. And so in my mind, I knew that my preaching to Assyria would literally be contributing to the Assyrians being able to come and conquer and judge and destroy my homeland. You can see why I didn't want any part of this. You can see why I did not want the Assyrians to repent. You can see why I didn't want the Assyrians to find grace and mercy before God because if they did, it may preserve them a little longer, just long enough to come and to judge Israel. This is the kind of grace I didn't want to have any part of. That kind of mercy and grace is repulsive and I want it to get as far away as possible from that kind of idiocy. And so I ran. I took an early retirement of sorts. The prophet business was good while it lasted, but God was going to have to find someone else to do his dirty work. I was finished. But that's not how God works, friends. We don't dictate terms to God. God dictates his terms to us. When you are a child of God, he will not allow you to run from his mercy and grace. It's true, God wanted me to preach mercy to the Syrians. However, that message was as much a lesson to me as it was to those Assyrians. I needed to see God's character. I needed to be reminded of God's relentless grace to me. I ran. 
but God chased me with His grace. In this morning, in verses 7 through 17 of my book that's titled with my name, Jonah, I want you to see today that if you are God's child, if you are truly His child, you'll never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. You'll never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. He will chase you. He will hunt you down. He will find you wherever you are to show you how good He is, to train your heart, to bring you back in mercy, to teach you what faith and trust looks like, to show you what an amazing, pardoning God He is and just how much grace He has to offer all sinners, not just sinners who you think deserve His mercy. You see, essentially, my view of God broke down. In Exodus chapter 34, God reveals His character to us, and it says it like this, The Lord passed before Him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This shows us the character of God. What is God's character? God's character is to be a God of love. But God's character is to also be a God of justice. Now when it comes to us, when it comes to our own lives, we love the God of love, don't we? We love the God of mercy. We love the God of grace. We like for us the God of, just, the God of grace and love. And we like the God of justice for other people. And we have our list, don't we? We have our list of those that God should be just with. We have our list of people that deserve the justice of God. Oh, we love the love of God. We love the mercy of God for people like us. And we know exactly who God should be just with. We know exactly who God should condemn. You see, but again, I had that mixed up in my mind. I'm not the one who dictates that to God. God dictates that to me. You see, all of us are due His justice. None of us are worthy of His love. Yet God graciously gives us His love and His mercy, even though we all are deserving of His justice. So this morning, I want you to see some ironies in this text of Scripture. I want you to see some interesting twists in these verses, verses 7 through 17 today. At this point, I'm going to have you open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 17. I am no longer Jonah. I am now me. And I will preach the rest of the message as me. But I wanted to give you a little insight from Jonah's perspective on what he might have been dealing with and why he decided to run from God. Do you notice some ironies in these verses with me? verses 7 through 17, the first irony that we see in the text is this. Jonah hid while unbelievers sought God. Jonah hid while unbelievers sought God. And I'm going to dip back a little bit and retread a little bit of what Pastor Zach did last week just to make sure he did a good enough job. I'm kidding, that's not why. Just to give some context here for you this morning, it says, in the text, verse 5, the marines, the mariners were afraid. They each cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship over the sea to lighten it for them. And so what they had here, these, these sailors were on the ship. They were scared. God had sent a large storm to them. And here they are on deck, unbelieving sailors, having a prayer meeting together. And while they're having a prayer meeting, Jonah's sleeping. Now, I have to confess that while I was in college, I slept through a few prayer meetings as well, but not quite like this. Jonah was in the bottom of a ship. He was sleeping, and while the prophet of God, the one who was supposed to be connected to God, the one who was supposed to preach the word of God, while he was sleeping, those who were unbelievers were on deck having a prayer meeting. 
Well, the prayer meeting didn't work. They still didn't know what the problem was. And so in verse 7, they decided to cast lots. They said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Now, casting lots is something that was done in the Near East. You read a lot about it. In the Bible, the people of Israel did it. They used some things in the Old Testament called the Umim and the Thumim, and they were some ways that the priests would determine the will of God. But beyond that, they would often cast lots to determine God's will. I'm not necessarily saying you should do this in your life today. I I hope when you pray you don't have a pair of dice with you that you're rolling at the same time to find out what God's will is. But this is what they did in the Near East. They thought that this would determine God's will. And so they thought, hey, if praying doesn't work, then let's cast lots. They were desperate to hear from God. They were desperate for God or the deities or their gods to speak to them to point out who the culprit was. Can you imagine this? Jonah standing there, and these men are praying. They're crying out, God, show us what the problem Please speak to us. What's going on? Why is this storm? Who's the problem? And there's Jonah sitting there. Kind of like, uh, stay quiet, stay quiet, don't say anything. So they decide to cast lots. Jonah's thinking to himself, I think I'm okay. There's a lot of men here. Surely it won't land on me. Guess what? They cast lots, and what happens? Lands on Jonah. God saw fit to have it land on Jonah. Here's Jonah, a prophet of God, staying quiet when unbelievers are seeking the will of God, when unbelievers are seeking to hear from God. The very one who's supposed to speak the word of God and to speak the will of God is quiet while unbelievers are seeking to hear the will of God and it falls on Jonah and he's outed. And we'll see what that looks like next. But I just want to pause here for just a moment. And just say that I think in a lot of our lives, we are often surrounded by people who are seeking something in their lives. They are seeking to hear from God. They are seeking to feel that ultimate joy and satisfaction. They are seeking for answers in their lives. They know that something isn't right. They realize that they are separated from God. And I think that people are desperately searching for something. And how often as believers are we standing by and letting unbelievers search for God, yet we have the answer answers, but we are slow to tell people about Jesus Christ. I think a lot of times we're just like Jonah. And why are we like Jonah? I think the reason we're like Jonah is because just like Jonah, we don't completely understand and grasp the grace of God the way that we should. If we really understood God's grace, if we were really enamored with God's grace the way that we should be, I think it would be more natural to tell people about the grace of God and show people what they're searching for. I had a friend that a number of years ago was very convicted about his lack of sharing Christ with his neighbors. In fact, he had developed a good relationship with his next door neighbor and they chatted a lot, they talked a lot, and this neighbor knew that he went to church and the problem is this guy never said anything to the neighbor about God or church or anything. And one day the neighbor asked my friend, hey, what time are your services on Sunday? My friend said, oh, it's such and such a time. And the neighbor said, do you think it'd be okay if I came to church? (laughs) My friend was like, oh, ouch. He said, actually, we don't accept unbelievers to come to church on Sundays. No, he didn't say that. But he felt massively convicted. Because here, after the course of several years, they developed a friendship, developed a relationship. And it was the unbeliever, it was the neighbor that invited himself to church. Because my friend had stayed quiet all those years. Man, how many times are we in situations just like this? These sailors are calling upon God. They're seeking God's will. They're praying, and the one that should know, the one that should be praying, the one that should be speaking the word of God is staying silent. But God didn't let them stay silent because God's grace always chases us. And if we are a child of God, then we will never be able to outrun the grace of God. I want you to see the second irony in the text here in verses 8 through 10. Jonah ignored God while unbelievers feared God. Look what it says in verse 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. Where, what is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing the presence of the Lord because he had told them. 
And so the sailors asked Jonah a series of questions, and he begins to answer these questions. And so let's go through these questions one by one. First question, who is to blame for this? Answer, verse 10. Jonah was to blame. It says he told them that he was fleeing from God. Question, where are you from? Answer, Jonah says, I am a Hebrew, which indicates I'm from Israel. Question, what is your country and what is your people? Now, this is digging a little deeper into who he is, not just really where he was from, but who he is. Answer, I worship, I fear the God of heaven, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Now, when Jonah says, I fear and worship the maker of the heavens and the earth, he is pointing to the supreme deity. All of the nations in the Near East believed that there were lots of gods, but they always thought there was a supreme deity. And Jonah is essentially saying, I worship the God. You worship gods, I worship the God. And at this point, the sailors are like, all right, that freaks us out. Fourth question, and this is a funny one. What's your occupation? Answer? Jonah skipped that question. Do you notice in the text? They ask him all these questions. Here's his answer, verse 9. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The men were exceedingly afraid. He told them that he fled the presence of the Lord, but he never answered the question, what is your occupation? Why didn't he answer that question? I can only imagine at this point that Jonah's feeling a little sheepish, right? Hey, what's your occupation? Oh, I'm <laughs> actually, a, I'm a prophet. <laughs> I uh, am supposed to be telling you about God. Oh, really? That's kind of interesting because did, did you realize we were standing here, we've been calling upon God, we've been trying to figure out what's going on here, and you're, Jonah never answered that question. He just kind of let that one slip by. And then we see the irony of the text as Jonah stays silent, as Jonah ignores God, the unbelievers fear God, and the result of this, in verse 10, it says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to this, What is it that you have done? Jonah's standing there giving name, rank, serial number, avoiding all other questions, and the sailors realize what's happening here. They fear God. They were unbelievers, and they fear God the way that Jonah was supposed to be fearing God. And I'm so fascinated in Jonah's response here in verse 9. He says, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God, the maker of the heavens and earth. I fear the Lord. Oh, really, Jonah? Do you really fear the Lord? Because it doesn't really seem like you're fearing the Lord. It might seem a little strange at this point that Jonah's claiming to fear the Lord. Because if Jonah really feared the Lord, then the question is this. Why doesn't Jonah obey the Lord if he fears him? But friends, is that really different from a lot of us? Is that really different from a lot of believers? People who claim to obey and fear the Lord and worship the Lord... Are we really following him the way that we should? It's interesting here, Jonah's trying to run from God. He's trying to stay as silent as possible. He's down in the bottom of the ship. He won't come up for the prayer meeting. He won't say that he's a prophet. He won't even acknowledge God in any way until the lot falls on him and suddenly the storm blows up in his face and now the God talk starts. But how often is that true in our lives? How often is that true in other believers' lives? The minute you get into a hard time, then suddenly the God talk starts, right? When things get tough and circumstances close in around you, suddenly you have much more of a press to go to church. Oh man, I, I, need, I need to get right with God. This, this, I'm not really liking the way life's been going here. And psh, the God talk starts. Oh yeah, I worship God. I go to church every now and then. I went to church every week when I was looking for a job, of course. Oh, yeah, I, I worship God, especially when my marriage is falling apart or when one of my kids is sick. Oh, sure, I, I worship and fear God. I come to church and worship for an hour, and then a couple times during the week I go get drunk with my friends. Oh, yeah, I, I worship God. And I worship on Sunday. I go and I sing and listen to the Word and then operate with dishonest business practices through the week. You see, there's a disconnect. There was a disconnect in Jonah's life. You see, if we worship God, actually worshiping God means that you obey Him. When you fear God, you should obey Him. And here's Jonah in complete disobedience saying, I fear 
God, but he really doesn't fear God. And God was not about to let Jonah get away with this. And friends, if you are a child of God, he's not going to let you get away with it either. If you are a child of God, you'll never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. God will not allow half worship for his children. He will press you further than that. He will show you how much you need him. He will drive you to himself. As Jonah desperately tried to ignore God, his actions unwittingly caused the sailors to worship Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth. And they say here at the end of this section, Oh my word, what have you done? You're fleeing the presence of Almighty God. And here the prophet is staying silent and the unbelievers are worshiping. I want you to see the third irony in the text and it's this, Jonah gave up, completely gave up while the unbelievers worshiped God, verses 11 through 16. Look with me in your Bibles, it says this, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him overboard into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. So at this point, Jonah is being called upon. They ask him, what shall we do to you? And it's interesting to watch revisionist history. It's always interesting to watch revisionist history, isn't it? And when you hear this story, oftentimes the story of Jonah is taught. And at this point in the story of Jonah, you usually hear it like this. Oh, here's Jonah now finally doing the right thing. Right? Jonah's finally owning up to his actions. And look at Jonah. He's sacrificing himself for all of these people. Jonah's kind of like Jesus here. Let me say this as clearly as I can. No, he's not. Need it any clearer than that? He's not like Jesus. In fact, Jonah's still not doing the right thing. If Jonah was doing the right thing, he would be repenting of his sin. If Jonah was doing the right thing right here on this ship, he would hit his knees to the deck. He would repent. He would tell God, God, I will do anything you want. I will go to Nineveh. And if Jonah would have repented and decided right then to obey God, the storm would have ceased. Jonah doesn't do the right thing. Jonah gives up. Jonah takes the easy way out. Jonah, listen here, this is, care this is in interesting very important. What's Jonah doing? Jonah's actually committing suicide. That's actually what Jonah's doing here. He's still not wanting to obey God. Jonah is actually opting for suicide over obeying God. Yet even in his suicide attempt, he's still a chicken because he won't throw himself overboard. He asks these men to throw him overboard for him so that they are guilty of murder and he's not guilty of suicide. Isn't, isn't that interesting? I mean, Jonah's got this thing all figured out and the men are wise enough to see what's happening here and so Jonah here is giving up. The unbelievers are worshiping God. Jonah, the prophet of God, has all the wrong answers and all the wrong actions and these unbelieving sailors have all the right answers and here's the answer from these unbelieving sailors. Jonah, I don't know if we want to do this. We don't want to be guilty of your blood. They don't want to throw him overboard. They don't want to be guilty of murder before his God. And so what's their answer? Let's try to get to shore even harder. Row, row, row our boat gently back to shore. Guess what? Doesn't work. The storm even comes up harder on them. And they realize they have no other option. And before they throw him overboard, they pray. And they say, dear God, please don't hold us guilty of this man's blood. They throw him overboard. And we don't know how long, how much time passed, but at some point, the storm ceased. And they were so struck with the power of God that they worship. Look what it says in verse 16. Then the, mere, the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. Vows meaning they decided to worship more. And 
We don't know if they offered sacrifices there, if they went to Israel or they went somewhere else and found a place to offer sacrifices to the Lord. But here it is, these men, these unbelieving sailors are worshiping God, whereas the prophet of God decides to end his own life in the sea. Friends, God won't allow this. God will not allow us as a child of God to run from his grace. He will continue to chase you down. You will never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. Jonah wanted to end his life, but God had other plans for Jonah's life. I wanted to see irony number four in the text. Jonah disobeyed, whereas a fish <laughs> obeyed God immediately. Now talk about a funny irony. Here you are, a prophet of God, the one that's been given the job by God to preach his word, to obey God, yet you are so disobedient that your obedience gets put to shame by a fish. Now I think... What's funny about this book is that Jonah probably wrote this book, and so he's really kind of smearing him. He's throwing himself under the bus as he's writing this book. I mean, he's showing what a doofus he was during this whole time. And it says in verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish. The Lord says to this fish, Go swallow this guy. The fish says, All right, God, I'll do whatever you want. God appointed a fish to swallow Jonah, and so this fish swallowed Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Now let's just cover a couple things quickly. What kind of a fish was this? Was it a whale? Was it a dinosaur? Was it some other kind of fish? And how did Jonah survive in the, the belly of the fish? Was there an air pocket in there? Was there somehow a way that he was preserved? What was it like in there? How long was he in there? It says three days and three nights, but was it actually three days and three nights? And I've got the answer to all of these questions for you. Ready for it? Don't know and don't care. That's my answer. Because it really doesn't matter. And it's really not the point of the text. But oftentimes when you hear about the story of Jonah, and you read the story of Jonah, and you read about the story of Jonah, these are the questions that everybody asks, and I'm asking you in all kindness this morning as your pastor, please don't ask those questions anymore because it's really not that important to the story. Here's what the Bible says, and I think we can take it at face value and believe what God says. The Lord appointed a great fish. Well, what kind of fish was it? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Evidently, that wasn't important for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us. The Lord appointed a great fish. It swallowed Jonah, and Jonah's in the belly of the fish for three days. And three nights. So let's talk about the fish. Let's talk about Jonah getting swallowed. What's interesting here in this is that the fish was not God's judgment on Jonah. The fish was not God's judgment on Jonah. The fish was God's grace for Jonah. This fish actually saved Jonah's life. Next week in chapter 2, we're going to study Jonah's prayer, and it shows us in chapter 2 that Jonah was on the brink of death after he had himself thrown overboard into the sea, and the fish actually saved Jonah's life. Now, I'm not saying it was fun for Jonah. I'm not saying that it was an enjoyable experience for Jonah, but let it be known clearly, this fish was a great expression of the grace of God as Jonah was trying to end his life, and God says, no, you aren't going to end your life. I'm going to save your life, and I'm going to do it through a fish. That's how much I love you, Jonah. Jonah's worst nightmare was exactly what Jonah needed. And friends, if you are a child of God, he will do the same for you. If you are a child of God, you'll never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. So what does it mean to run from God's grace? Well, God's grace is a gift. God's grace is the gift of His presence. God's grace is a loving God who looks at humanity that is far from Him, who's alienated from Him, a mankind, a humankind who's decided to rebel against his creator who at one time had perfect fellowship and mankind decided, no, I don't want God's presence and separated himself from God. God says, in my grace, I'm going to give you the gift of my presence again through the Lord Jesus Christ, dying for your sins so that you can have that relationship restored. God's grace is a gift. It's the gift of his presence. It's the gift of his guidance. It's the gift of his love. It's the gift of his leadership. It's the gift of his correction in our lives. 
And God's grace will chase us relentlessly. When you become a child of God by faith in Jesus, you gain the privilege of knowing Him and having His presence in your life. That is grace. And part of that is yielding and obeying and trusting and following what He wants for us because it is best. But because we're rebellious and we sometimes want to run from this, God will never let us run from His grace if we are truly His child. We may try to run. We may try to push Him away. We may try to do life our own way. But if you are a child of God, you can never outrun the relentless grace of God. God taught Jonah that lesson. God taught Jonah that it's dangerous to maneuver your life to suit your own needs, to dictate your plans to God. It's dangerous to go against what God is asking you to do. It's dangerous to disobey your God. It's dangerous to tell God that He cannot give grace to certain people. It's dangerous to push God away and to try to run from His grace because His grace will always catch you. And here's Jonah trying to run. He's in the bottom of a, a boat, and they call him up to the deck. He's trying to run from God, and all he gets himself into is prayer meetings and Sailors calling upon God and lots that land upon him and having to come clean on who he was and confessing God and he's watching unbelievers worship around him and he's the one that's supposed to tell unbelievers about God and he doesn't, but they end up worshiping God anyway and he's just surrounded by God's grace. He can't get away from it. And friends, if you're a child of God, he'll never let you outrun. He'll never let you outrun his grace. How do we outrun or how do we try to outrun God's grace? Well, we do it in a number of different ways. God wants us to know Him through His Word, and we run from His grace sometimes when we neglect His Word in our lives, when we don't read the Word the way that we should, when we aren't consuming the Word the way that we should. We're pushing Him away. We're trying to run away from His grace, and God will not let you do that. God will not let a true child of His just exist in half worship. He will always draw you back. When people have hatred in their hearts for their enemies, when people have hatred in their hearts for certain groups of people or certain kinds of people or they speak derogatorily about certain types of people, that is an expression of trying to run away from the grace of God, but God will never let you do that for very long. He will drive you back. His grace will come and find you. We outrun God's grace when we fail to obey simple and clear directives from the Word. When God says, love your spouse. When God says, love your neighbor. When God says, abide by my sexual ethics. When God says, don't be filled with jealousy. When God says, don't covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's car or anything that's your neighbor's. When God says these things, that's an expression of His grace. And we often want to rebel against those things. And friends, if you're a true child of God, He will never let you outrun His grace. He will chase you with that relentless grace. When we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts towards other people, that's an expression of trying to run from the grace of God. When we can't see fit to forgive those around us and we harbor bitterness in our hearts, we're essentially saying to God, God, I appreciate your love, but this person is not worthy of your love. They are worthy of your justice. That's running from the grace of God just like Jonah did. Now, yeah, we do this all the time, don't we? We see this even when we're young and when our kids are young. Recently, dealing with my kids, I've got three, and I'm going to tell you a story about child A and child B. They're going to re remain nameless just for anonymity's sake. Child A reminded us one day, hey, Mom and Dad, don't forget, Child B was supposed to get a spanking. <laughs> Thank you, Child A. Appreciate that reminder. Child A, did you remember a few days ago that you were supposed to get a spanking as well? And Mom and Dad forgot about it. So, Child A, are, are you still going to insist that Child B gets a spanking? Child A thought for a moment and said, no, that's okay. It's <laughs> a good answer. Right, but that's essentially what Jonah was doing, isn't it? God, the people of Israel, your people, we deserve your love and mercy. Those people 
They are disgusting, vile, cruel, undeserving of your grace and mercy. Send them to hell. Did you forget who you were? When we harbor bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts, we are running from God's grace the same way that Jonah tried to run from God's grace. And friends, God will have hard lessons for us. He will come after us. He will show us in very graphic ways that bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts. If you are his child, you will never be able to outrun the relentless grace of God. You see, Jonah's mistake, and by extension, our mistake is forgetting that our sins are just as heinous to the nostrils of God as anybody else's sin. His forgiveness to us is just as undeserved as his forgiveness to the worst of sinner that you can think of. We love God's grace, don't we? But we love God's grace on our own terms. And that's exactly what Jonah did. But God let him know that that was not acceptable. When you are his child, he will never let you run far from his grace. He will chase you. He will point out your inconsistencies. He will remind you of your own sin and of his great forgiveness. And sometimes he may even decide to use a great fish to help you get the message. Some of you right now in your life, you're in the middle of your worst nightmare. Some of you in your lives, you've come through your worst nightmare. All of us sitting here still have nightmares ahead of us. Friends, if you are a child of God, that worst nightmare is exactly what you need. And sometimes those worst nightmares are the result of our sin. Sometimes those worst nightmares are just the result of the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world. But all of those worst nightmares are appointed by the hand of God to help us know and to appreciate His grace, to experience Him in new ways. A friend of mine in high school was running from God's will. He was feeling in his heart that God wanted him to go into the ministry and to go to a Christian college, and that's not for everybody. I think you can glorify God in any way He leads you. But this guy particularly was being moved in that direction, but he was resisting it. Our youth group was going on a college trip to see some different colleges and he didn't want to go and he used football as an excuse. I don't want to miss a game. And so a few weeks before the college trip, they were doing warm-ups in football and he was doing some drills and he ran and he dove to catch a ball in the end zone. He landed on his shoulder and broke his collarbone. Guess what? Season over. He's not going to play. Guess what? He goes on the college trip. Attends that school been in the ministry ever since. You see, the collarbone was appointed by God. It was an expression of God's love and God's grace in my friend's life. The great fish for Jonah saved his life. Whatever nightmare that you have in your life, past, present, or future, is exactly what you need, and God will use it in your life to show you his grace in a new way. Because when you are a child of God, you cannot outrun His relentless grace. He will chase you down. Friend, I don't know where you are in your life, but wherever you are, you're never going to be able to outrun His relentless grace. You may go down the path of disobedience. You may go down the path of apathy towards the Word. You may go down the path of unforgiveness. You may go down the path of bitterness always to run away from God's grace. However, God will always be there to chase you down, appointing difficulty and disaster to save you, to teach you, to confirm to you His relentless love. Because if you are a child of God, you cannot outrun the relentless grace of our God. I'm reminded of a story I heard Years ago, a little boy was disobeying his mom and dad, and they sent him to the corner, and he stood there, and he was fidgety, and he hated it, and he told his parents he hated it, and he says, that's it, I'm running away from home. So he goes upstairs, and the mom said, fine, you better pack a bag. He says, I will, I'm going to pack a bag. He goes up to his room, he starts getting clothes, and he packs a bag, he comes out to the hallway, and his mom is standing there, and she has her suitcase out too. The little boy says, mom, why do you have a suitcase? She says, well, if you're going to run away from home, I can't let you go by yourself. I love you too much. If you're going to run away from home, 
I'm going with you. And I love that story because in many ways it's what God does for us, isn't it? We try to run, we try to hide, we try to push him away, try to neglect the word, try to have unforgiveness in our hearts. But God is always there, knocking on the door. God's always there, revealing himself to us if you are a child of God. Jonah tried to hide in the bottom of the boat. God brought him to the top. Jonah tried to hide on the top of the boat. God outed him with the lots. Jonah tried to not tell what he did. Avoid his occupation. And soon God outed him on that as well. Jonah tried to commit suicide, throw him overboard, and God saved him through a fish. God would not let that man go. And if you are a child of God, you cannot outrun the relentless grace of God. Let's bow for prayer this morning. Father, I pray this morning that you would show us who you are, Father, through whatever storm, whatever disaster, whatever nightmare that we have going on in our lives. Father, the story of Jonah is a story about us. It's a story of a man who doesn't like how you function, who loves you for your grace and mercy, but wants to dictate that on his own terms. And Father, we do the same thing. We say we love you. We say we worship you so many times in so many ways. We want to do our own thing, live our lives our own way. Father, I pray that as we do that, that we would see your hand of grace in our lives chasing us down, that we would see evidences of your presence, that we would yield to that, Father, that we would repent of the hardness of our hearts and come back to your glorious grace in our lives. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.